Good evening, everyone. I'm Alfonso Santa Maria from Spain, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce this ERS uh, webinar. This uh, webinar is brought by to you by the ERS European Railway Society and Olympus, and this is the first uh, session about uh, the first part of the Rhinology Emergencies, yeah, and it's titled Rhinology Emergencies That Keep You Awake During a Call. It's around one hour, and please, if you have uh, any question, just tap it, and at the end of the session, uh, we can discuss it. So as uh, the first speaker, we have uh, Son Curry. He came from UK, from New Newcastle. He's the president of the European Rhinology Society and works in the um, Friedman Hospital and the University of uh, Newcastle. And it's going to speak about uh, how to manage orbital abscess, differences between pediatric and adult cases. So please, Shankari, thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Alfonso, and good evening to uh, everybody in the audience. And thank you very much for uh, asking me to uh, give a talk this evening. Um, so uh, Pavel asked me uh, to talk on uh, the management of uh, orbital abscesses and um, really to sort of highlight the difference between uh, pediatric cases and uh, adult cases. And I'm going to give you my uh, experience of, uh, of this and uh, delve a little bit into the uh, literature. Um, it's quite a niche uh, little area, but um, I thought what we would probably best start off with was just a little bit of generality about uh, orbital inflammation and infection, just to kind of remind you of the, uh, the salient um, uh, points. So let me just advance on. So this is really what we're, we're talking about, isn't it? The, um, the, uh, the, the inflamed or the hot orbit, um, as opposed to the, um, the quiet orbit. Um, and I kind of have this checklist that I go through uh, when I see a patient presenting like this. Um, and I think, you know, if we, if we rewind a little bit, I, th I think this condition, orbital cellulitis, is, is poorly understood by non-ENT surgeons and non-ophthalmologists. So doctors in other specialties and general practice often look at patients like this and think, well, this must be an eye problem or a skin problem, and therefore it's not really very serious. But we all know that this is potentially extremely serious um, from a site perspective uh, and also from a, um, a, 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 a sepsis perspective. So I, when I see a patient like this, go through a sort of checklist, as I said, in my, uh, in my own head. And the, and the things that I'm interested in are the onset. So, so when did all of this swelling around the eye um, start off and uh, how quickly has it, uh, has it come on? You want to take a full history. So you want to take a, a visual history, and we'll come on to that in a second. You want to take a nasal history. Um, does the patient have a preceding respiratory infection? And you also want to take a history looking at the other possibilities. So has the patient had an injury to the eye? Has there been a, 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 an insect bite or an episode of trauma? Or have they had a conjunctivitis or a grumbling eye problem that might have preceded this uh, swelling? But as ENT surgeons, of course, we're really interested in the cases that are associated with um, sinusitis. I've put in capital letters, open the eye. You must look in the eye. You must open those eyelids as best you can to see what the state of the underlying globe is. You want to have a little look and see if the patient has a temperature. You want to assess the cranial nerves, so not just the orbital cranial nerves, but the, uh, the full set of cranial nerves. And this can be associated with intracranial problems, of course. So you want to assess for any signs of meningism. And when you do open the eye, what sort of things are you looking for? Well, we can see clearly in this slide here, the patient has edematous, swollen, tender, upper and lower lid. And as you open the eye, you can see that in the lateral corner of the eye, we've got some pus sitting in that area there. But the most striking feature here is of that uh, chemosis, the so-called 
conjunctival edema. And you can see how it's sort of swollen and folded and hemorrhagic. Um, and that's a really important sign of raised intraorbital um, pressure. We want to, with that eye open, check the movements of the eye. So can the patient elevate and depress the eye, abduct and adduct the eye? Um, and then you want to assess um, their visual acuity. And you can do that, uh, obviously, by asking the patient to um, read some text. Uh, can they read newspaper text? Can they read smaller text? Um, and ideally, you want to assess them uh, with a Snellen chart. So that's the ophthalmological assessment. Um, and if you have the opportunity, you can use the Ishihara plates. So these assess red color vision um, in their first 14 of the uh, series of plates. Um, and uh, red color vision is the vision that you tend to lose, first of all, with raised intracranial, uh, sorry, raised intraorbital pressure. I think if you have the opportunity um, to involve an ophthalmologist, then I would counsel you to do so at an early stage. But I wouldn't hang around waiting for an ophthalmologist before you make some of the critical decisions you need to in managing the patient. Um, so if this patient is losing their vision in front of your eyes, which is unusual but can happen, you want to act quickly. And in the case of a child, um, I would suggest involving a paediatrician um, as well. Uh, for eye uh, assessment in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an eye which may not be quite as inflamed and you decide to uh, uh, manage medically, and we'll come on to this, uh, you want to assess the eye regularly, more frequently if you, um, than twice a day if you have particular concerns. At the outset, you want to uh, assess nasal endoscopy and have a little look in the middle meatus and take some pus for culture and sensitivity if that um, is appropriate uh, and there is discharge there. Now, no talk on orbital inflammation would be complete without mentioning Chandler's classification. And, and the reason I mention this, um, and to some extent it has been superseded by imaging because Chandler's classification was based on clinical and operative findings, it preceded CT imaging. Um, but they, almost all the studies that report on orbital inflammation talk about the various um, stages uh, of orbital inflammation. So no talk on this would be complete without mentioning it. And the five stages are there on the left-hand side. However, I think there are a number of issues with the classification. Um, firstly, not all the uh, complications are truly orbital. And so uh, cellulitis of the lids, as you can see in this first example, isn't really an orbital problem. It's more of a, uh, a superficial facial problem. And one could argue that uh, uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis, this fifth um, uh, example here, is actually an intracranial problem. But the main issue with Chandler's classification is that these episodes of uh, differing inflammation don't happen independently and sequentially. You can have uh, the onset of an orbital subperiosteal abscess before you have any changes to, of cellulitis or superficial inflammation. And so they don't necessarily follow this nice um, sequential uh, suggestion of uh, Chandler's uh, classification. So don't be drawn into um, uh, security you may get from uh, uh, suspicious, uh, suspecting that only one uh, uh, type of inflammation can be present at any one time. Radiology has really superseded um, the place of uh, Chandler's classification in terms of making the diagnosis or uh, addition to the diagnosis. Um, and it's important um, in terms of uh, defining uh, the extent of inflammation for planning uh, treatment and also for monitoring treatment. We'll come on when to scan shortly, but I'd just like to point out there really is no place for plain x-rays. There's uh, no place really for ultrasound in the management. Um, and we don't go for MR as uh, scanning as our primary uh, scanning modality. We would consider MR imaging if we were concerned about intracranial complications or cavernous sinus thrombosis, perhaps.
but not for orbital cellulitis or intraorbital abscesses. So the commonest cause, of course, uh, that we see as ENT surgeons is paranasal sinus inflammation on the ipsilateral side. Um, but the anatomy is important to consider because the orbit is uh, a uh, pear-shaped um, uh, uh, box, essentially, um, which has uh, a rigid uh, margin and therefore expansion cannot occur to any significant extent within the orbit. So if you have inflammation developing within the orbit, uh, you're going to get to a critical point uh, where blood flow can't leave the orbit and blood can't enter. So you're going to initially get uh, retinal um, uh, uh, vein thrombosis and then retinal arterial thrombosis because the orbital septum, which runs from the uh, margin of the orbit down to the palpebral fissures, uh, either lower or upper, doesn't allow uh, expansion. So it's critical um, to be aware of this. So if we look initially at the early stages of preceptal cellulitis, the important thing to note from the uh, table there on the left-hand side is the absence of significant clinical signs other than swelling um, of the, uh, the lids, eye movements, vision, and papillary um, uh, uh, defects are absent. Um, and if the eyelid swelling is mild, then you may want to consider managing this as an outpatient in conjunction with your ophthalmology colleagues. Um, but with regular review, and certainly I would review this patient at 24 hours, with safety netting of the patient to explain to return if there was any deterioration whatsoever. Postceptal inflammation is different because it is associated with changes um, as it evolves uh, with proptosis, uh, gradual reduction in eye movement, concerns about vision, and then at end stage, uh, a relevant papillary defect. But don't be drawn into the reassurance that if you don't have these signs, that you don't have orbital cellulitis. It may be at a very early stage and not yet mani manifesting as visible signs uh, on your uh, clinical examination. So what are the indications for bringing a patient into hospital? Well, I think these really are the indications. The, any concern about post-septal inflammation, uh, if the patient has uh, any form of immunocompromise or the child is young, if you're unable to assess the eye, you shouldn't be discharging the patient. And if patients are not settling with appropriate antibiotic therapy, I think that would count as an indication for bringing the patient into hospital. And who should we image? This goes back to sort of when should we image? Well, if we can't assess the eye, whether it's just impossible to open the lids or the patient is in too much pain, then we're going to have to get some imaging clearly to assess that eye. Any significant eye symptoms, I would uh, arrange CT imaging uh, with contrast. Failure to improve or failure to resolve after 24 to 48 hours, I would consider as well. And clearly, if there was concern about intracranial involvement. And that's why when you request imaging, you should request contrast enhanced CT orbit sinuses and brain. So if we do have an evolving post-septal cellulitis, so an orbital cellulitis or Chandler's uh, uh, stage two, how do we manage this? Well, in my own unit, we have our own local antibiotic guidelines and many hospitals do. Uh, and we would manage this with intravenous tazacin or clindamycin and kiprofloxacin in those patients who weren't able to take tazacin. And a pediatric patient, we would have uh, coamoxiclav uh, with its, its, its extended cover, kef and met, kefuroxim and metronidazole if that's not possible. Nasal decongestant, intranasal steroids, and I can't emphasize the importance of regular review. Regular review by somebody who is experienced um, at assessing an orbit. So eye observations, uh, visual checks, and neuro observations. 
Uh, and as I said, I, I would prefer if the eye observations were done by an ophthalmologist uh, in the, the hospital, if that is at all possible. And if you don't have an ophthalmologist, that may uh, in, uh, uh, mean that you act more quickly to scan if you have any concerns about vision. So moving on to the sort of point of discussion that Pavel wanted me to raise, and this is the, the subperiosteal abscess. So here we have um, two coronal cuts. You can see that these are soft um, tissue windowing uh, images. Uh, we can see the uh, orbits uh, nicely there. Um, and what we can see clearly um, is an area of low attenuation in this left orbit uh, with an area of uh, rim enhancement, the high attenuation surrounding that. And this is typical of a medially placed um, uh, intra, uh, sorry, subperiosteal uh, abscess uh, with associated uh, ethmoid uh, inflammation. So, sphenol, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, subperiosteal abscess management, SPA we'll call it in children. So there, if we look at the literature in terms of management, there are lots of studies out there that confirm that non-surgical options are achievable in managing these patients. But if you look at the literature, between 14 and 93% of selected case, cases, so there's a wide variety um, in, uh, in the literature about which patients should be managed medically and which should be managed um, surgically. And the evidence base is not brilliant because it is poor quality evidence. The studies are invariably retrospective, often over a number of years, um, and associated with small numbers of patients. So there is not a strong evidence base here. And there are certainly caveats about who should and should not be managed uh, uh, medically. And certainly any clinical deterioration in a pa patient who should be managed um, uh, or who's being managed medically should be uh, associated with prompt reassessment for the potential of abscess formation. So uh, who should we consider for medical management without surgery? Well, when you're making this decision, it's a fine balance between avoiding surgery and the risk of complications, because we need to be absolutely clear that complications can evolve rapidly. And, and once you have a complication, there is urgency um, to, to manage that patient, and there is potentially the risk of losing vision. As it, going back to the, my sort of uh, anatomical demonstration earlier in this, uh, presentation. But we can consider medical management by experienced clinicians in the following cases. So in younger children, studies tend to suggest that children under the age of nine do better than children over the age of nine. In children who have normal vision at assessment, who have normal visual movements or normal uh, eye movements, and in medially placed small volume abscesses. So let's look at the literature in a little bit more detail. We look at this study in 2006 um, by Oxford and colleagues looking at um, 43 patients, retrospective, again, less than 18 years. 18 patients had medical treatment without surgery, 25 had surgical treatment. The, uh, the, the uh, children, as you can see, had no significant uh, ocular signs and they proposed criteria for medical management uh, was normal vision, as we discussed, pupil and retina, no ophthalmoplegia. They measured intraocular pressure, less than 20 millimeters of mercury. They allowed for an element of proptosis of five millimeters. I personally am a bit uncomfortable with that. Uh, and an abscess width of less than four millimeters. And again, that's just it's difficult to measure small abscesses. Um, so we have to just be careful about our criteria. A later study by Todman uh, in 2011, uh, looking at four years data and 29 patients. Uh, they had a surgical group and a medical group and they analyzed the two of them. Um, there were eight patients in the surgical group, 21 in the medical group. The mean age uh, or, or the age range was broadly similar. Um, and the mean volume 
in the surgical group of abscesses drained was uh, 3.5 centimeters. In the medical group, it was less than half a centimeter. But the interesting output from their study was that no patient who had a volume of less than 1.25 mils or centimeters cubed uh, required uh, surgery. My apologies, that mean volume should be 3.5 centimeters cubed, and that should be 0.4 centimeters cubed, just to avoid any confusion. This study, a later study in 2014, again, around about 30 patients, a tertiary uh, center. Um, this uh, looked at patients with uh, abscesses uh, either less or more than 3.8 mils. So that's a really quite a significant size of abscess. Uh, and 12% of the, those under 3.8 mil required surgery, 71% over 3.8 mil required uh, surgery. So that 12, yeah. So there's a, there's a, a very significant difference between the numbers uh, requiring surgery in each of those two gr groups. I look at this and think, actually, that's a lot of pus in an orbit. And I would be uncomfortable personally leaving an abscess of three and a half centimeters uh, uh, without considering um, surgery, but we can discuss that at the end. So what are the indications for surgery? Well, a superiorly based abscess, um, I would uh, argue is the case, and most of the literature uh, is in agreement with that. We've talked about uh, deteriorating visual signs, uh, intracranial involvement, uh, and poor response to antibiotics. If you have frontal sinus involvement, I think there's a bit of controversy here. Some of the studies suggest that you can manage medical, uh, manage these patients medically. I personally would be a bit concerned about an uh, orbital, ab uh, a subperiosteal abscess in a patient with a completely opacified frontal sinus. But again, we can discuss that. Older children, I think we should be more careful about and any abscess volume above 1.25 ml, we need to be more careful about. In adults, um, if we move over now to the, the older age group, there's very little uh, in the literature about this. And I think it's fair to say that surgery remains the treatment of uh, choice here. There is one study looking at um, patients uh, who were managed uh, either medically or um, surgically, surgically. 12 had uh, conservative management, seven had surgery. But in this study, there was a lack of clear selection criteria. So we weren't told about the extent of orbital inflammation. We weren't told about where the abscess was. We weren't told how, how, how big the, the abscess uh, was. And like many of these other studies, they are small number of patients. So I think before we can move away saying from surgery being the treatment of choice, we need more evidence. Because if we don't manage these patients appropriately, we have significant potential complications. Corneal ulceration, as you can see here, is uh, a complication of a, uh, an orbit uh, which uh, has been exposed, uh, and those other complications, as you can see there as well. Surgery, uh, if I briefly just uh, mention, I'm not going to go into technique at all, but I think you need to choose the technique you are most comfortable with. Um, so uh, this, the, the, this, the gold standard really is an endonasal decompression with uh, limited ethmoidectomy and a middle natal antrostomy. But if you're not experienced doing that, then you should consider an external approach. And if you've got an intraconal abscess, then we would want to involve ophthalmology. If we've got cavernous sinus thrombosis, we would want to consider uh, decompressing the sphenoid sinus of pus and consider steroid treatment and anticoagulation. So my conclusions, ladies and gentlemen, are a thorough assessment of the hot orbit is vital and don't delay treatment if, uh, if uh, uh, things are progressing. The small medially placed abscess in a quiet eye, less than 1.25 mils, is potentially a patient for medical management that any suggestion of deterioration should be considered for urgent reassessment and possibly surgery. Alfonso, I, my apologies, I've uh, overrun a little bit, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, for this clear presentation. And now um, remember to the, to the audience that uh, all the questions, they can tap and we can discuss at the end of the session. So as a second speaker, he came from Italy, Maria Turi Zanoni, 
a member of the ERS Junior Board and works in the ENT department of uh, the University of Insubria, Varese. And he's going to talk about the post-traumatic neuropathy, what to do. Thank you very much, Alfonso. Here we are. Okay, you can see my screen, yeah? Okay. Alfonso, you can see my screen? Yeah, I see, but uh, is the, the general panel. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. No, no, yes, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm gonna talk about post-traumatic optic neuropathy, what to do. Well, as you know, uh, optic uh, nerve uh, traumatic disease represent lesion that involve the optic nerve uh, secondary to a trauma, uh, resulting in severe visual disability. Uh, luckily, is, this is a very rare occurrence. It may occur in one or two percent of patients with closed head trauma. And from a pathogenetical viewpoint, we can have an injury of the fibers inside of the optic nerve without damaging of external sheet of the optic nerve. Or in other cases, we can have an hematoma formation all around the optic nerve, exerting a pressure against the optic nerve. In other cases, we can observe an edema within the fibers of the optic nerve with a stretching of the fibers of the optic nerve. In other cases, we can have a small fragment of bone uh, that compress the optic nerve. Much more rarely, we can have a late optic nerve neuropathy due to the scar tissue formation at the level of the area of the trauma of the optic nerve. Uh, basically, we can classify optic uh, neuropathy, traumatic optic neuropathy, according to the site of the injury of the optic nerve along its course. It's not so frequent to observe uh, traumatic optic neuropathy at the level of the intraorbital segment of the optic nerve, as well as in the intracranial segment in, of the optic nerve. Conversely, the most uh, frequently involved area of the optic nerve uh, is the intracanalicular segment because, as you know, the optic nerve sheet is strongly attached to the bone of the optic uh, canal. Uh, and so uh, the swelling of the optic nerve within the canal is susceptible to the delayed effects of ischemia. And so the intracanalicular segment is the most frequently involved site of traumatic optic neuropathy. Regarding the mechanism of injury, we can have direct traumatic optic neuropathy, traumatic disease of the optic nerve. It means that uh, we, we can observe a transaction of the optic nerve, for example, after craniofacial trauma or um, more rarely, we can have a penetrative wound lesions uh, such as knives that disrupt the integrity of the, of the optic nerve. But direct lesion of the optic nerve is not so frequent, are not so frequent. Much more frequent are the uh, indirect mechanism. Indirect mechanism means that uh, some high energy forces from distances exert an increasing pressure inside to the orbital cavity and the increased pressure inside to the orbital cavity acts a force, a pressure against the optic nerve within the optic canal. So once again, the most affected segment of the optic nerve is the intracanalicular segment where the pressure acts against. And uh, when you see a patient, uh, of course, this is, can be a patient with optic optic neuropathy, you can hypothesize such disease when the patient have an history of trauma or the patient has been already has been operated uh, some year, some hours before uh, for functional endoscopic sinus surgery or other skull based procedures so history of trauma uh, craniofacial trauma or iatrogenic trauma and uh, your patient can have decreased in visual acuity and also decrease in visual field perception and also uh, color perception. So the patient 
need an ophthalmological evaluation, fundus oculi. Uh, evaluation can be normal because retina and optic disc um, can be normal in the first hours after the, trau the trauma. And uh, the only thing you can observe is an afferent popillary defect in some cases. And so um, you can also, of course, perform a radiological assessment, uh, basically CT scan. Uh, and with radiological assessment, you can exactly identify the location of a, of a trauma. For, for example, you can identify a small fragment of bone uh, that exert a pressure against the optic nerve. Uh, this is a grading system um, this, um, that, that has been described by Cook in 1996. And uh, you can see uh, much more severe optic neuropathy is when there is uh, no light perception and when there is a uh, lesion in the posterior part uh, of the optic uh, cone. The problem when dealing with uh, traumatic optic neuropathy is that uh, there is no guidelines to treat such disease and there is no evidence-based recommendation about such disease. Basically because this is a very rare uh, disease, very rare occurrence, and so it's quite impossible to perform prospective randomized studies. The International Optic Neurotrauma Study was started in 1994, but after a few years has been stopped because no data available, because uh, to, um, not, not, so, not, not enough patients were, were enrolled. And so uh, has been transformed in an observational study. So it's not possible to perform a prospective randomized trial. And also it's quite hard also to perform studies uh, demonstrating neural function recover over the times. And so we have to base treatments according only to anecdotal case series. Uh, treatment uh, for traumatic optic neuropathy can be medical or surgical treatment. Medical treatment include mega doses of corticosteroids. Uh, high doses of corticosteroids has been used also for uh, other traumatic neurological disease, especially in case of spinal cord trauma. Uh, where has been described that uh, high doses of corticosteroids um, delivered in the third, within the first eight hours after trauma may improve visual uh, function. Um, from a pathogenetic viewpoint, high doses of corticosteroids may have a very important antioxidant properties, may reduce the edema of the optic nerve of the and the optic nerve sheet, and also may reduce the vasospasm related to the ischemia and so improve the blood flow at the level of the injury site of the optic nerve. Uh, generally speaking, we talk about Boston protocol uh, when, when dealing with uh, traumatic optic neuropathy. Boston protocol include methylprednisolone, uh, 30 milligram pro kilo intravenous, one shot, so very high dose of corticosteroids. And after that, we can go on, go ahead with the continuous perfusion of corticosteroid, 5.4 milligram for, pro kilo per hour for at least 24 hours. And so uh, we can also follow our patient with seriated ophthalmological evaluation in order to uh, detect some um, improvement in the visual acuity and also in the color perception. But uh, we have to keep in mind that high doses of uh, steroids uh, delivered intravenous uh, can be associated also with uh, some complications, some problems, has been described also 5% mortality with such high doses of corticosteroids mainly related to liver failure. And so we have to discuss with our patient about this possibility. We have to uh, perform a, a very good count and very deep counseling with the patient. And we have to propose to your patient, both medical therapy and surgical therapy. Usually for patient, for young patient without other comorbidities, we can start with the Boston protocol, including mega doses of corticosteroids. Uh, surgery, 
is indicated uh, for patients uh, with no response to megadoses of corticosteroids and uh, should be performed as an emergence procedure because more rapid will be surgery, more uh, will be the possibility to improve the function, the visual function uh, on long term. And um, the surgery include optic nerve decompression, especially the level of the optic canal. We can have very different uh, surgical option from craniofacial surgery through tra transantral approaches, microscopic approaches. But as you know, in the last decades, endoscopic endonasal surgery uh, gained popularity and also uh, have been performed more and more frequently. And so using the endoscopic endonasal approach, we can perform a decompression of the optic canal and we can um, expose the medial side of the optic nerve. Of course, we have to perform a transetmoidal and transphenoidal procedure in order to expose the lamina papyracea and address the optic nerve at the level of the sphenoid sinus. So basically we have to start our surgery with a sphenoidectomy. We have to drill out the interoptocarotid recess and we can also drill the papyracea in order to exactly identify the cone of the orbit, because if we follow the cone, the shape of the cone of the orbit, it it's, will be much easier to identify the optic canal. We can, after that, remove the bony fragment of the op optic canal. We can identify the optic nerve sheet. And after that, we can perform an incision at the level of the, of the optic nerve sheet. And also in some cases, also we can mm, cut the annulus of zin. Uh, when we perform an incision of the optic nerve sheet, uh, you can also observe a small amount of CSF leaks. Uh, to do that, we have to be quite um, um, cautions in order to identify exactly the optic nerve and not damage other structure at the level of a sphenoid sinus. Uh, if sphenoid sinus is well pneumatized, high pneumatized, the identification of optic nerve, optocarotid recess, and carotid artery will be more easy. Conversely, in the concal uh, variant of a sphenoid sinus, so when the pneumatization of a sinus is very small, it will be much more challenging the identification of a sphenoidal landmark. This is an anatomical demonstration of a sphenoidal landmark. We are on the left side. Intersphenoidal sinus has been already removed. We are on the left side. This is the optic, uh, sorry, this is the um, internal carotid artery. This is, once again, sorry, because it's much too much rapid. Okay, our video. This is the optic nerve, this is the lateral OCR, the medial OCR, and this is the internal carotid artery. Okay, so we can turn the scope on the other side, on the left side now, you can see. This is the two optic nerve right side, optic nerve left side, and this is on the left side, once again, the intrasphenoidal landmark, lateral OCR, medial OCR, this is the impression of the internal carotid artery, and this is the impression of the optic nerve. So it's quite important to exactly identify the sphenoidal landmark in order not to have complication. And uh, much more the sphenoid sinus will be pneumatized, much more easy will be the procedure. Um, apart from the lesion of the uh, internal carotid artery, another artery that can be damaged in such procedure is the ophthalmic artery. Uh, in the large majority of cases, ophthalmic artery runs at the level of the inferior and lateral side of the optic nerve. Uh, and so uh, it is not so frequent to encounter the ophthalmic artery on the medial side of the optic nerve. However, we have to keep in mind that in the 15% of cases, ophthalmic artery might run also medial to the course of the optic nerve. And so there is a variability in the course of ophthalmic artery. And so we have to exactly identify the artery and also we have to try to preserve, of course, this artery and avoid damaging of such artery in order to avoid bleeding and also uh, worsen 
the visual uh, situation of your patient. This is the ophthalmic artery seen from lateral view and from the medial endoscopic view. So where is the safe area, area to do the incision of the optic nerve sheath? Well, of course, the safe area to perform the incision of the optic nerve sheath is the supero-medial quadrant because in the large majority of cases, ophthalmic artery runs inferiorly uh, inferiorly in the inferior and lateral quadrant of the optic nerve. So if you stay in the superior part and in the medial part, you can uh, reduce the risk of lesion of ophthalmic artery. So this is only an anatomical video to show the surgical technique of surgical decompression of the optic nerve and, and canal. First, we start drilling the bone of the optic canal in order to expose the nerve sheet. And so you can see one, once the nerve sheet has been exposed, you can exactly palpate yeah, the optic nerve sheet and then you can perform an incision of the optic nerve sheet. Uh, in this man during this maneuver, you can also encounter just a little amount of CSF leak. No problem, don't you worry, because of course, all around the optic nerve, within the optic nerve sheet, you can observe some CSF. And here you can see ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery that runs in the inferior and lateral quadrant uh, of the optic nerve. In some cases, also you can cut just a little the annulus of zine in order to improve the uh, motility of the optic nerve, okay, like in these cases. And in, in case of a traumatic optic neuropathy, you can also remove some, some small fr bony fragment from the optic canal. And this is a case in live surgery. So also in this case, we are on the left side, you can see. Uh, usually we can also um, help the procedure by drilling down just a little the lamina papyracea, uh, preserving the integrity of the periorbit, otherwise per the orbital content should herniate inside to the uh, surgical field, and also you can impair your surgical technique. But you can see if you remove just a little the, the lamina papyracea, you can exactly identify the shape of the cone of the orbit, okay? Identify the shape of the cone of the orbit, and so you can better identify the position of the optic nerve. In this case, you have performed also a decompression of the orbital content. But I think that Pavel, after that, we can we uh, can address specifically this topic. And you can see, you can exactly identify the optic nerve sheet. And once the optic nerve sheet has been exposed, we can cut the optic nerve sheet in order to decompress the optic nerve. This is a clinical case I would like to show you because this lady uh, experienced uh, traumatic optic neuropathy after a surgical procedure. This lady has been operated uh, in another uh, hospital uh, for functional endoscopic sinus surgery and unluckily a small fragment of bone uh, was introduced uh, at the level of the orbital cone, especially at the level of the optic canal on the right side. And so uh, after surgery, immediately after surgery, uh, the patient experienced hypovisus, so impairment of the visual field, impairment of the color perception, and also ptosis. The patient was immediately transferred to the radiological suite. But per, uh, she underwent CT scan. And um, this is the CT scan, uh, the images of the CT scan. And so the patient was transferred to our tertiary care referral hospital where uh, she has been submitted to a surgical procedure. This is the last case I like to show you. And here we are on the right side, you can see. Right side, we are going to drill out completely the lamina papyracea. This is the break, the area of a lesion of the lamina papyracea. 
So we are going to remove the small fragment of bone from the orbit. This is inferior rectus muscle, medial rectus muscle. And here we are drilling out the bone of the optic canal. And after that, you can see this is the right side optic nerve. We are cutting the annulus of zine, and also we are we are going to do an incision at the level of the, of the optic nerve in order to decompress the optic nerve. This is the post-operative MR scan that was good, and the patient luckily uh, have, uh, improved his visual field, uh, not completely, but uh, just a little. So, in conclusion, we can say say that uh, luckily traumatic optic neuropathy is very rare complication of head trauma. And luckily there is no guideline uh, that can be followed. Uh, we, can have, uh, we can have medical treatment using mega doses of corticosteroid that can be used uh, alone or in association with surgery. Surgery usually has been performed uh, using an endoscopic endonasal transatmoidal sphenoidal approach. And uh, optic nerve decompression, however, requires an anatomical knowledge and also some surgical skill in order to perform such a kind of procedure without complication. Uh, and um, the, the last things I would like to uh, say is that, is that uh, this is really an emergency procedure. And so we have not to... Um, no time and you, you, you have to transfer your patient immediately to treatment. Otherwise you can reduce the possibility to the treat and also to uh, improve the visual acuity of your patient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mario. Very impressive images and videos. So now as a third speaker, we have Paul also from UK. He's the chair of uh, our year's junior board, and he works in the Guy's Hospital in London. And he's going to speak about urgent orbital decompression, indication, and surgical pit fails. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Alfonso, for introduction and other speakers for excellent talks. Thank you for tuning today in. And I'm going to talk about orbital uh, urgent orbital decompression something which you actually might encounter during the on-call or late shifts. And if this is not done properly, it can give you some nightmares. So I think it would be good to go through, uh, run through the procedure, how to do it uh, in a way that patient will benefit and uh, you will also be happy with the outcome. So the, we're going, I'm going to be talking really about acute orbital compartment syndrome which means rapid increase in orbital volume, which then uh, results in elevated orbital pressure, risk of ischemia of optic nerve and retina. This happens most commonly in our scenarios after FES or during the FES. And of course, then uh, traumatic cause is the most common, but maxillofacial colleagues would probably deal with this, as, uh, especially in UK in the first place. And then there are also some more uh, rather rare um, causes like vascular abnormalities, um, then orbital cellulitis with or without abscess if it is rapidly growing, and some tumors can rarely present in such a way. Risk factor is always anticoagulation therapy. Um, the anatomy, uh, when it comes to anatomy, the most important is the artery, which is uh, most commonly injured, severed, and that's the anterior ethmoidal artery, and then also posterior ethmoidal artery. Those are the branches of ophthalmic artery, which uh, arises from internal carotid artery. So the anterior, uh, both these arteries, they penetrate lamina papyracea, which is a paper thin bone into sinonasal cavity, and then uh, continue or uh, crawl on the anterior skull base and into the uh, and uh, in intracranium. So you can cause the damage either inside of the nose and there is a retraction of the anterior ethmoidal artery inside of the orbita and then it causes bleeding so-called retrobulbar hematoma or and I think this is more common is that you will penetrate most commonly with powered instruments such as uh, microdebride you will penetrate the lamina papyracea periorbita and inside you will cause uh, an injury to the 
anterior ethmoidal artery and bleeding uh, is within the orbital content. So you might not necessarily see a clear palpation. Um, what doesn't really help is that orbita is formed by bony walls. So there is a limited expansion of the volume. Therefore, the patient with a bleed, you will see that there is immediate proptosis, painful proptosis, if the patient is awake. And therefore, orbital blowout fractures are protective against compartment syndrome, which also uh, means that removing laminar paparatia would help. But I'm going to come to that because that's a step. That's, that's the second step. The normal pressure is about 8 to 21 millimeters of Higrum. And if it is more, then it's considered as elevated. But in a patient with an acute compartment syndrome, orbital compartment syndrome, the pressure is 40, 50, even 60. Um, and I think the question of the day is how much time you have since the start of the bleeding. So we don't have much of a studies on humans uh, from obvious reasons. And from animal studies, we know that irreversible damage to optic nerve happens after 105 minutes and total optic nerve atrophy occurs after 240 minutes. To be safe, I always say, tell to my trainees that you have got about one hour. And therefore it is important to check the time from the start. So keep the timing so you know how much time you have. And then just a uh, final clarification of the pathophysiology, you can see that there is a beautiful diagram of uh, retrobulbar hematoma, which is here uh, behind the, uh, the eye uh, or the, the globe. It's, it's pushing the eye anteriorly and then also compressing the optic nerve. A further increase of the pre, uh, further increase of the intraorbital pressure causes decrease of the perfusion pressure, so the blood cannot come back and drain. Uh, and first affected artery is the posterior ciliary artery, um, because the systolic pressure within the artery is fairly low. Then the second one is central retinal artery, as um, Mario nicely showed which is initially protected by the overlaying optic nerve and then also high systolic pressure inside of that artery. And then lastly, what makes the whole situation worse is the venous pooling, which means that when the pressure is really high, blood cannot be drained through the veins and there is further increase in the pressure. And this all then uh, results in optic nerve compression and ischemia. And if this is not treated properly, there is a serious risk of loss of vision. Um, so this is a nice management scheme, um, which I think is relevant for the ENT surgeons. First of all, you have got clinical suspicion. Now the clinical suspicion in the scenario number one is on the table. You're operating, you do something wrong, for example, enter the orbital contents or you clearly damage the anterior ethmoidal artery because you see the palpation or the posterior ethmoidal artery and you will see the proptosis. Uh, you don't need, of course, then uh, symptoms as a pain. You are happy just with the fact that the patient has got really golf ball-alike eye and there is proptosis and, uh, and pupil is dilated. That will immediately be seen. And it is also important before the surgery to check whether the patient doesn't have anisocoria or, um, or, or didn't have any surgery of the eye uh, before because then you might freak out if you will see dilated pupil and it will be not correct diagnosis. And then the second scenario would be the patient usually in recovery or later on who will be partially awake or awake. And then you can check for symptoms, additional symptoms, which means um, painful proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, loss of red light reflex, again, tense heart globe, loss of direct uh, uh, light reflex. You, in such a scenario, in combination with a reduced visual acuity, you will not be running to get a Snellen chart or Ishihari table because you know that this is an emergency scenario and you have to act now. Symptomatology like this will be now. So then you set the diagnosis of retrobulbar hemorrhage, check the time when you start, when you set the diagnosis, and call for senior colleague. You always need more hands 
it's really helpful. Um, if you have a colleague with you, then the person should call ophthalmologist or yourself, but do not waste too much time if, you, if you're late. The medical management is adjuvant treatment, which is, which usually is offered after the surgical treatment, which is the most important and should never delay the surgery. Keep that in your mind that ophthalmologists will not, or the medical treatments will not save the patient. And the most important is, of course, the immediate lateral canthotomy and inferior cantholysis under GA or LA. If the patient is awake, it's fine. You can do it under LA in the recovery. If the patient is on the table, obviously, you will do that over there if it is needed, if you cannot see the bleeding uh, vessel. Important to say is that the bleeding vessel, so the other end of retracted anterior ethmoidal artery, which is within the intraorbital uh, contents, you don't really want to look for it vigorously because you may cause more of a damage to the intraorbital contents or nerves and the muscles. Um, the, in such a case, the compression is the most important. So do not look for the artery with the bipolar inside of the orbiter as you might really cause more of a damage. Once the eye is decompressed, I'm going to talk about the procedure later, then you can proceed with the final or definitive surgical management, which is either re-exploration, evacuate the hematoma, in trauma decompress the orbit, but it's also the case after FES. So the procedure itself, which I think is the most important, and everyone should know that because this is eye-saving procedure, and we had quite a few cases where this was not done properly because uh, maybe lack of training. So you can see on this beautiful diagram that you there is a orbital rim, lateral orbital rim, lateral orbital tubercle, and out of that there is a tendon which is divided into superior and inferior limb. You want to cut the tissues overlying the orbital rim, and then you want to cut lateral canthal tendon. And this will give a sufficient decompression and you will save a time if it will not be insufficient. Um, once this is done properly, you will see eye, pro, uh, massive eye proptosis, so the eye will come out from the eye socket, from the orbiter, which is a sign of decompression, and you will see change in the pupil size. So once you've done it properly, the pupil will come back to uh, the normal shape or normal size. So you normally you start in local anesthesia with a lignus span. <clears throat> you will just infiltrate soft tissue. You don't have to, but usually it's ideal. Then you will place the hemostat on the soft tissues of the canthus. Um, hemostat or artery clip is ideal. You will wait for 15, 30 seconds. Once you remove the clamp, then you will take a scissors and cut the soft tissues. And once the, this is the first stage, so this is lunch or canthal for me, you have to expose the bone. And in the second stage, you have to cut the tendon. You will then feel with your finger uh, a tendon, which is like a string. Uh, it's a quite uh, typical structure, easy to find, and you will cut it. I will then show a video afterwards. Essentially, this is the direction of the scissors. So you will, uh, you will be going uh, downwards. Now, this is a reconstruction, eye reconstruction, so this is not uh, a urgent scenario, but this will give you more of an idea about the anatomy. So here you can see that, first of all, we need to cut the soft tissues all the way in order to expose the orbital rim. Um, normally, we do it much faster. You will, ex you will cut all of those tissues until you see the orbital rim. You can use a hemostat to dissect or scissors. Um, normally you just do it in, with one or two snips. There is no need for careful uh, and slow dissection. And I will just pause it here. The tendon is down there. So then you will feel it with your finger and cut the tendon. In this case, we were also cutting the conjunctiva, but uh, in an emergency scenario, you should have your scissors direct downwards. And on the next video, uh, I found this, this is not mine, this is uh, of, of the colleagues from America, 
and they shared it on YouTube. And so you can see a uh, really the emergent scenario where the patient has got really bleeding. Firstly, you place a clip, it should be quite fast. You wait for 15 seconds, then you will snip it with the scissors. You want to see, so it's quite rapid. Couple of uh, snips, then you will feel the bone under uh, the tip of scissors. You know that you're in the right place. And afterwards, uh, then you will perform the inferior cartilisis. This is the post-operative image of one of my patients that was orbital reconstruction, but this is five days later on, and you can see that this is the scar is barely visible. So don't worry about that. The major problem is a uh, is ectropion, which again can be fairly easily uh, reconstructed later on by oculoplastic colleagues if needed, but usually it's likely not. Um, so they can perform a sling. And now in the second stage, you want to offer the patient the definitive treatment. Second stage means that you will take the patient back to from recovery to theater, or if you're in theater, you will, you will evacuate, you will, uh, sorry, you will remove the lamina papyracia. Now I would keep it simple uh, in, a, in a way that the key is really to expose the lamina papyracia by uh, ex expose the periorbita by removing the lamina papyracia. So when you, you do that procedure with the frears, with the blunt parts, you probably at that stage, you already had a uncinectomy was done, ethmoidectomy was done. If not, then you will remove the overlying structures. You will expose the and dissect the, uh, the tissues off from lamina papyracia. Uh, then first of all, you will infracture the, you, uh, the, the, the lamina papyracia inwards, and then you will twist your blunt end of frias, and then you will remove the bone medially inside of the nasal cavity. Now, usually you penetrate on the, uh, the periorbita and there is a fact exposed coming out, bulging. Um, that's fine. I would not uh, decompress it in a way as, a, as in a Graves disease, simply because uh, very often this is now sufficient and you will see the pupil come back to the uh, normal size uh, and and that is enough. Now, if you see the anterior ethmoidal artery uh, and bleeding, then obviously you need to coagulate it. But this, if this is deep within the orbital contents, I would not chase it if you don't have much of an experience with that because you can cause more harm. Um, and uh, if you can, you can then dilate that entrance point uh, of whatever instruments you use to uh, you, when you cause a damage of the anterior ethmoidal artery, you can just open up that entrance uh, point and uh, evacuate the hematoma just simply by letting it flow outside. And in most of cases, there is a spasm of the anterior ethmoidal artery and it should uh, stop spontaneously. Uh, and you want to see basically this outcome. This is a real patient who had a decompression because of um, urgent bleeding. Post-operative care, now we need to keep the patient overnight, definitely. You want to closely follow up for any change in pupillary, pupillary right reflexes, visual acuity, color vision, eye movements, because if you haven't uh, stopped, sealed the, the, the end of the anterior eth ethmoidal artery, you might, uh, it might open up and there might be further uh, recollection. And then really you want to make sure that this will be uh, caught uh, quickly. Uh, ahead, you want to elevate slightly to decrease the arterial pressure. I would say that oral antibiotics definitely should be uh, given. Avoid nasal packing. You want the blood to be flowing freely into the nasal cavity. And uh, tell the patient not to blow the nose um, uh, and sniff forcefully. And in terms of the outpatient follow-up, you want to check the patient if there is ectropion uh, of the lower lid. And if that's the case, then ophthalmologists need to see the patient. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pavel, for this presentation. Also, thank you for these incredible videos. Uh, I don't know if we have time for for the discussion because it's uh, past nine.
Pavel, what do you think? Let's do a couple of what's the two, three questions. Yes. Okay. So, Tom, there is one question for you. Um, is lateral cantotomy something uh, to consider in patients with impeding bleedness secondary to an orbital abscess to buy time to buy time until the urgent formal surgical decompression? No, I don't. I don't think in general that that is the the case. I think if you've got a uh, a subperiosteal abscess, you should manage the abscess definitively. Um, because all you're, you, you, by the time you get a patient um, uh, down to theatre and organised and sorted out, um, I think you, you sh it, it, it's not usually that urgent to get the patient uh, done within you know, 10 or 15 minutes. You, it's usually an evolving situation that is slower than a, a, an orbital bleed. So no, I don't think in normal circumstances you should consider doing that. Okay, thank you, Sam. I'm from Mario. There is uh, two interesting questions. The first is that uh, can the heat produced uh, by the bone drilling the bone damage the optic nerve? Well, it depends because you know, uh, in large majority of cases, we are dealing with a patient which who is already blind, and so you have nothing to risk in addition. So, uh, so. It, it can be useful to try, to try also to expose your patient and the optic nerve of your patient to the surgical stress in order to recover the situation because in the large majority of cases, uh, the, the, the optic nerve of your, of your patient is already injured. So uh, not, not so much additional injury with a drill. If you, have, if you are skilled, you have not so much risk. Okay. Thank you, Marion. Another question for you is that uh, regarding the CSF leak after the incising the optic nerve sheet, have you found that the dye stop uh, spontaneously or have you been had to repair them due to persistent leaks? No, no, no. Definitely uh, he stops spontaneously without do other things. So it's only a very small amount of CSF that will ca come out from the optic nerve sheet but uh, no, no need to reconstruct or nothing. Stop spontaneously. Okay. Thank you, Mario. And for Pavel, there is uh, one question that uh, if uh, on anticoagulation, uh, would you use reversal agents? And what do you do, what do, you do with uh, the DOACs? Now, this is emergency scenario, really. Um, so you're in a situation when the time is running, you've got 60 minutes, uh, a little bit more maybe. Uh, it's not really time for that um, at, at the moment when it's happening. Now, because this is a FAS, uh, most likely the patient has been reversed already. So you would not really see a patient with an INR of three on the table because the patient already has stopped uh, warfarin or any other medication. So if this is a trauma, obviously it can be the case, um, then a uh, you would have to reverse it if it is reversible. Um, but at the same time, the most important is to save the eye by decompressing it. So the loss of blood is not significant. So the blood loss, there is a risk of reaccumulation afterwards that you have to work on, but uh, that will that, that's not a direct emergency situation. I mean, the, the coagulation state. So my answer is that in a FES, you will not really be dealing with that because patient is optimized in a trauma. Yes, afterwards, you will just reverse it in whatever way you uh, can because there are different agents and different options of uh, reversing it. Okay, Paul. And another question for you is uh, in case of anterior ethmoidal artery bleeding and after the, remova the removal of uh, the lamina papyracea, uh, what will the anterior ethmoidal artery uh, what do you do? Um, it will be yeah. stop bleeding because of the pressure of inside the orbital tissue. So I had a case now recently when 
that was on the Earth Archer was severed inside of the orbiter. And so I had a, um, a trainee with me who was excellent. So he was able to hold the scope and I was able with uh, four hands just gently to dissect um, the tissue away from the anterior ethmoid larger inside of the orbiter because that's where the bleeding was and uh, I was able to coagulate it but that's a case when it's not fully split if it is fully split then the end will be likely inside of the orbiter uh, and it will be difficult to find it and if you want to find it then obviously it will be hosing so you haven't you cannot see it uh, when we had the other case such as this one complete um, uh, split then we just simply left it. So we decompressed the orbiter, left it inside of a spasm, and the patient was fine. Uh, I think looking for the, uh, for the, for the end, that, would, that can cause a lot of damage if you would be burning tissues around inside of the eye. OK. Thank you very much, everybody. I think we can finish the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you.